So the big one I hear, COVID is no worse than the flu. Okay, yeah, we hear that one occasionally too. And uh, when you look at the data, when you look at the evidence, it's uh, absolutely not true. The, the virus, the COVID virus is uh, far deadlier than the flu. Uh, each year we lose, you know, due to mortality, about 30,000 people due to the flu. And as you know, because uh, it's highly publicized, the number of deaths that we have so far in the, you know, the months that we've been dealing with COVID is uh, close to 300,000. So this is a much different virus, uh, far deadlier and uh, definitely not uh, comparable to the flu virus. The flu has disappeared this year because everything is being classified as COVID. Well, every year we have a flu season. Uh, we had one last year and we also had COVID and uh, there were people who suffered both flu and suffered from COVID as well. And sometimes uh, that happened at the same time for people. Uh, we have uh, separate tests that we conduct for COVID and for the flu. They're two entirely distinctly different uh, viruses. We have a test for each one of them. Uh, we have not seen a robust flu season yet, meaning we have not seen a lot of patients testing positive for influenza, but we know that the flu season can really start anywhere between October and, and March. So sometimes we have a, an early flu season, sometimes we have a later flu season. And uh, the good news is that all the masking and all the uh, precautionary measures that we're taking, they work for COVID and they also work for flu because it's transmitted largely the same way. Doctors are classifying all deaths as COVID because hospitals profit from COVID deaths. Yeah, you know, I, I've heard this one too, and, and I'm uncertain of the exact uh, origin uh, of it, but, uh, you know, healthcare providers, hospitals, physicians, you know, we're, we're tied to an oath. And so uh, when we see and diagnose people, it's based on what they presented with. And now that we have robust testing for COVID, we're able to uh, order a test and determine uh, that uh, it is COVID. Uh, there, uh, there was a CARES Act where hospitals, like other businesses, were able to um, uh, receive uh, dollars from the federal government related to uh, hardship that uh, the pandemic has caused. And so I think that uh, that myth may have come from some of the, the CARES Act dollars that hospitals receive, but uh, has nothing to do with making a diagnosis, has nothing to do with uh, patients who actually have or do not have uh, the disease. You know, we look to make that diagnosis based on presenting symptoms, based on diagnostic testing, and most specifically the COVID test itself. So uh, I don't believe there's any fact in that one. 99% of people survive COVID. It's no big deal. Yeah, so it's actually a little bit higher than that, but uh, we have to look at uh, what 99% looks like. So, uh, you know, we have 350 million people in this uh, country. If, uh, if we accept that, if we accept that 1% is okay, that means that 3.5 million people die from COVID. And I think that we would all look at that and say that's not acceptable uh, at all. We put uh, a lot of effort and, and energy and, and resources into things that are far less deadly than that. Uh, things like airplane crashes and uh, things like automobile accidents and, and death that results from uh, those. So 1%, which uh, sounds small on the surface, when you start to dig deeper, you realize uh, uh, what a big impact 1% uh, uh, actually has. So 1% um, uh, death rate uh, is very significant. And I'm guessing that most people know far more than 100 people out there. And uh, we all definitely don't want to know somebody who's been affected in that way by COVID. Looking at CDC data, it looks like deaths are even lower this year than previous years. Yeah, I'm not sure where people are getting that because, uh, um, you know, we know factually that death rates overall have gone up and, and those um, those death rates are largely attributable to the pandemic itself. And in fact, in some states and some age groups, COVID is actually the leading cause of death uh, right now, number one cause of death uh, among certain age groups. So uh, it's something that uh, we really shouldn't take lightly when we hear facts like that because overall death rates uh, in our country have gone up. And uh, in fact, uh, from COVID, um, certain groups, it is the number one cause of death. Only old people get sick and die from this. Young people aren't getting sick. So what's the big deal? Yeah, so the truth is that you really don't know how COVID is going to affect you if you've never had it and contract it. We have examples from every single age group. Uh, in the state of Ohio, we've had uh, deaths uh, less than one year of age and all the way up to 109 years of age and everything in between. So although we know that certain groups, uh, including uh, uh, elderly people, uh, are at higher risk for contracting severe disease, 
uh, that can still happen and does happen in people without risks, uh, without uh, uh, an age risk. And uh, it has nothing to do with contracting and getting the disease. So um, although certain age groups are affected disproportionately, it uh, doesn't mean you still can't get and transmit the virus or be an unlucky person and suffer severe disease, even if you don't have risks. I know somebody who tested positive for the disease and they've been tested multiple times and those count multiple times towards the state's total. Uh, actually, I can speak to Ohio and to most states. Uh, most states uh, count the data by uh, counting the individual, not by counting the positive tests. So uh, in most cases, uh, those aren't uh, duplicated and they aren't uh, artificially inflating the numbers. The only reason we're seeing more cases is because we're doing far more testing than we were in the spring. Uh, well, the truth is that we are doing more testing. And so when you do more testing of uh, um, uh, the population in the setting of a pandemic, you're bound to find more cases of illness, but it doesn't mean those illnesses aren't real. And those people aren't potentially either suffering or transmitting the disease to people who are at risk. So al although we're seeing the numbers go up, those are real cases of real individuals. And uh, it's a, a signal or a beacon is, uh, to tell us the amount of uh, disease that, uh, that's out there. And by most estimates, the, uh, the prevalence of disease is actually far higher than the testing that we're doing because we know people get sick and we know that they don't get tested. And uh, those people are in our population. They affect the uh, prevalence and the spread of the disease. And so depending on which study you look, you see that uh, uh, anywhere from five to eight times higher than the actual numbers is what we truly believe to be the actual disease prevalence. Masks are overrated. There's no evidence that they can prevent COVID. Yeah, that, that's unfortunate because it's uh, probably our best line of defense right now. So we know that uh, in the laboratory and then we observe settings where people uh, wear masks and settings where people do not wear masks. And we know uh, repeatedly through uh, observational studies and then laboratory conducted studies that uh, the likelihood of transmission goes down considerably when individuals wear masks in the communities where they interact with other people. Masks can actually be dangerous because they reduce your oxygen levels and they increase your carbon dioxide levels. Yeah, so masks can be uncomfortable, they can feel restrictive, but uh, there is no significant evidence that any of the uh, available masks that are out there uh, impair an individuals to exchange oxygen and maintain normal oxygen saturation. So there really just uh, isn't enough space in front of the mask for enough carbon dioxide to accumulate in that area. Uh, and there's enough airflow in most cloth masks and most paper masks and the other masks that we see out there that uh, we might uh, purchase at retail outlets. Uh, uh, they, they allow for enough air exchange that uh, uh, reduction in oxygen levels in the body really aren't uh, an occurrence. There are actually plenty of hospital beds available. I'm looking on the state's dashboard and it says 25% are available. Yeah, it's, it's sad to hear that too. And, uh, you know, percentages are, uh, are a difficult um, uh, way to judge actual hospital capacity because having a physical bed is one thing, but having a physical bed that's operational with staff members and adequate resources to provide the care uh, that's needed to the individual that's sitting in that space is yet an entirely uh, different thing. And uh, if you uh, talk to individual hospitals uh, in the area or even just outside of our area or even across the country, what you find is that most hospitals right now, the majority across the country are operating at or near capacity on a daily basis. And that's something that can change can change hourly. So uh, although we may have one or two beds right now, we may be in a deficit of beds in a couple hours. And then throughout the night as uh, patients get discharged and less patients come into our facility, we might open up a few more beds, uh, but it's a constantly changing dynamic. And uh, most hospitals in our area right now are either at or just above uh, usual capacities. This whole pandemic has been overblown and we're doing more harm by locking people down. Yeah, you know, I, I hope that people don't view it as being overblown based on the impact that it's had. And if you talk to individuals that have been either personally directly affected or have friends or family members that have been uh, affected, I think that uh, you'll, you'll hear that described another way because uh, the impact is real. Uh,
uh, the amount of uh, death and disability that it's caused already. And, you know, uh, we haven't even gotten through all the holiday weekends uh, has left a, a huge impact as, as many of us uh, know. Uh, but when it comes to shutting down, when it comes to imposing restrictions, uh, there are many things that need to be considered uh, in the grand scheme of things. So not only do we consider people's uh, life, but we also consider their livelihood, uh, our community values, um, our uh, economic factors, and our social factors that all have to be considered when uh, decisions are made. And those are what our community members look at when they uh, uh, are in a position to be able to uh, uh, impose or loosen restrictions in our community. Uh, but it's a big picture. There are many pieces to the puzzle and uh, all things need to be considered when uh, we decide at the end of the day how much we uh, should or shouldn't restrict uh, you know, our way of life for our entire community. I don't trust the vaccine. They're just going to give me the virus. And so the vaccine is very new and uh, the first two vaccines that are coming to market right now, as most people know, are the Moderna and the Pfizer vaccine. Uh, neither one of those uh, vaccines actually have any virus in them. They only have the genetic code for the protein on the surface of the virus. So it's a very small portion of the genetic code. There is no live or uh, uh, deactivated virus in the vaccine at all. It's simply code that is absorbed by your body that generates a response so that your body uh, um, produces an immune response that is ready to fight the virus when you're actually exposed to it. I've already had COVID. I can't get it again. Yeah, so we know that that isn't true. We know that people have uh, gotten COVID more than once. Uh, fortunately, it's an uncommon occurrence and we don't see that in most cases. But again, we're only nine months into this pandemic. And what we don't know is what we're gonna see in people that have had COVID that have some form of immunity, how long that immunity is going to last. So it could be a year, it could be more than that. Uh, and in some cases, in some individuals, we have observed shorter time frames where they have had COVID and had a, a second time, uh, which is uh, uncommon, but uh, is a possibility. If we just let everybody get it, we'd have herd immunity. Okay, so herd immunity is a concept where enough of the population of individuals gets the virus that the virus doesn't have enough contact points to actually spread effectively. So in essence, the herd or the large groups of people protect the vulnerable because there aren't uh, as many contact points. Uh, when, when you consider that, you, you have to consider the number of people in our country that have been exposed and contracted COVID. So we know that right now about uh, 13 million people have uh, uh, had COVID. If you double that or triple that, we're still far fewer than uh, even close to the 70% that we would need to achieve to have what most experts would consider herd immunity for COVID. So uh, we have a, a long way to go. And in between now and then, there would be, uh, oh, I just got cut off. Uh, Tasha, I think you need to, I'm going to have Tasha log back on. We need to do that again. I'm be happy to do it. I, I think I can, you jiggled the mouse. I'm sorry. I can still hear you. Did you lose the video? Nope. Oh, so you got it all. Okay. No, yeah, I haven't lost anything. Uh, so I guess if uh, if it phases out, you can just keep going. Okay. Yeah. But, <laughs> uh, do you want me to start over? Yeah, why don't we do that again? So, um, if we just let everybody get COVID, we would get herd immunity eventually. Okay, so herd immunity is a real concept that uh, um, can be achieved either by way of allowing the disease to spread naturally or achieving herd immunity through vaccination, which is the better option. Uh, herd immunity is, um, is a phenomenon that happens by which enough individuals in the community get the virus thereby reducing the number of contact points for the virus to jump from person to person. And so uh, that causes the virus to eventually fade away and it protects the large group and the vulnerable population because enough people have had it. It's largely agreed that we need at least 70% or more of the population to um, acquire either immunity through vaccination or immunity through contracting the illness in order to achieve herd immunity. We're nowhere close to that in terms of the number of people that have actually had COVID. So despite the number of uh, people that have had COVID and the amount of deaths that we've had from COVID, there's still uh, 
millions, hundreds of millions of people in our country that still have not had the disease and still have not been exposed to it. So uh, the amount of uh, suffering and death that would occur between now and the point in time that we reach herd immunity through natural disease spread is uh, something that I think most of us uh, wouldn't be willing to tolerate or wouldn't want to tolerate. The better way to achieve herd immunity is through vaccination, which is coming in just weeks now. And last one, the hospitalization numbers are so high because people are in the hospital with COVID, not because of COVID. Um, I, I'm not sure I quite understand that one. Can you? So, so what people are saying is that uh, people are going into hospital for like a knee surgery and they're doing tests on them and oh, you're positive with COVID. It's not because they had to go to the hospital because they're having so many bad COVID okay. symptoms. So I'll just ask you that one again. Okay, yeah, I understand a little bit better now. Um, okay. So uh, people who are hospitalized uh, for COVID are hospitalized because they're ill. Um, most people might be surprised to know that uh, the majority of patients that come into our emergency rooms and to our uh, physician's offices and are diagnosed with COVID, they're sent home to recover because most people can uh, recover effectively at home. So the hospital spaces are reserved for those people who have more severe illness, people with uh, decreased oxygen levels or more critical complications related to uh, the complications associated with COVID. So we wouldn't occupy hospital beds for people who have COVID just incidentally and aren't sick from COVID. Okay, very good. I'm going to hit stop recording.